Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. All right, thank you, Matthew, and uh, thank you, special singers. Uh, I, I pray that uh, right in the confines of your own home, that you were able just to focus in on God and uh, be reminded of who He is through that powerful presentation of the gospel in song. Uh, today, uh, I have a message that I have entitled, Good Riddance. And it's uh, really found from the text of Hebrews chapter 12. So uh, I hope you've had plenty of time to get a copy of the Word of God, whether it's electronically or whether it's just in book form or however you got it. And turn there with me to Hebrews chapter 12 and uh, verse number 1. Today we're going to be talking about fresh starts. I was thinking about us being in this uh, season in our culture and uh, what, what a season it is. And, and I've really, um, it, it's been a time of new beginnings for me in a lot of ways. And, and I think if we look at this thing from a proper perspective, uh, we'll identify that this is a wonderful opportunity that God has given to us to start over with some things. Uh, the staff and I have been really praying and seeking God and laboring, and I promise you it has been labor. Uh, to discover, you know, what we're going to look like after this is over. H how is church uh, going to be after this is over? And so we're, we're already identifying that we have a wonderful opportunity to have a fresh start. Do you know God is a God of fresh starts? When, when you get to thinking about even our calendar, th this message today would be a, a great New Year's Day message. But God is just kind of designed, we have 365 days out of the year. We have 12 months, so really there, you, you can have that annual fresh start, and then you can have a, a, a monthly fresh start, and then you can have a weekly fresh start. And the fact of the matter is, you know, you kind of wake up every day with a new beginning and a new fresh start. Um, I, I, was, I was thinking about my own golf game. And uh, the, the difference, and I love the game of golf, and, and I'm not very good at it, but I enjoy playing it. And occasionally, uh, I'll have a really bad hole. Now, the thing about golf and, and being a good golfer, uh, you, you have to be able to put those bad holes behind you because you've got a new beginning with the next tee box. Uh, with the next hole that you're playing. So even in golf, you can have as many as 18 fresh starts. The other thing about playing golf is that none of us really like to wear apparel that is cumbersome. Uh, you, you can't play good golf if you're going to play it in a straight jacket. So you buy clothes that stretch, that are big enough, that stretch, and that you've got plenty of room for movement in, or else you will never be able to play the game the way that it ought to be played because you get bound up and it affects your club head speed. Now, God says, I want you to run this race of life, but I want you to run it without being encumbered. I don't want you to run it by being bound up with a lot of distractions and limitations and hesitations. And I, I want you to run it with as few hindrances as you can possibly have. Now today, uh, in these few minutes that we have together, I want to look at three hindrances that I believe that you need to get rid of out of your life in order to run this race that God has for you. And that brings me to the text today in Hebrews 12. Listen to what the Word of God says. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So let's dig in for a few minutes as I look for a little bit on some three hindrances that we need to release, that we need to stop, that we need to let go of. First of all, I want you to think with me that we need to quit 
playing God. You heard right. You didn't misunderstand me. I didn't stutter. We need to quit playing God. Well, you say, well, well, Pastor, how in the world do we play God? Well, when we start living life as if our life depends on us, we all of a sudden have ignored that God is on the throne and we live our life as if everything is relying on our ability and our strength. Here's what God says in Psalm 46.10. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. You say, now pastor, be more specific with me and tell me how do we play God? Well, we, we play God by worrying, by worrying. Living life as if it all depends on you. Uh, playing God means that you are living as if God is not in control, that he does not care about you, or that he will never care about you. So a situation arises, circumstances evolve, and uh, it may not be conducive to comfort in our life. And so the very first thing that we do is Man, I better get a hold of this. I, 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 better, I better get a handle on this. And automatically, we get stressed out and we start worrying. So God comes along and he says, let go of that kind of philosophy. Let go of your worries. Let go of your anxieties and, and, and all of your concerns and just relax, God says, and let me be God, and I'll take care of the things that are in your life. Um, do, do you know one of the reasons that we need to let go of the things that we brought into this pandemic with, and as a matter of fact, uh, even some things that have developed in the midst of this pandemic, uh, the, one, one of the reasons that we need to let go of that stuff is because it's not going to be too much longer until there are brand new circumstances and there are brand new situations. There are brand new uh, things that are going to evolve in our life. And, and, and if you don't let go of what you've already brought into this, there's not going to be any room uh, to even handle and dispose of those things uh, that are on the horizon. Now, let, let me give you three reasons why you need to let go of that stuff. First of all, it zaps you of energy. Have you noticed that? Uh, the psalmist David said in, in chapter 55, he said, I am worn out by my worries. Have you ever noticed how exhausting worrying can be? Have you ever noticed how it just zaps you uh, of all of your energy? And you wind up stewing without the doing because it just robs you of the strength that you need to put one foot in front of the other. The second reason you ought to let go of worry is because really worry exaggerates the problems that have arisen in our life. In the book of Psalm in chapter 25, David said, my awful worries keep growing. Have you ever noticed that something happens in your life and when you start worrying about what happens in your life, then those problems just seemingly grow and they get bigger and they expand uh, uh, and, and just get worse and worse. You know, worry never has and never will solve any kind of problem. Maybe something like this has happened to you. Somebody said something very unkind to you. Now, when they first said it, it really didn't bother you too much. But you got away from that situation, got away from that person, and you put some distance between you and them, but that uh, unkind word just begins to roll around in your thinking, and you think, I wonder what they meant by that. Did they really mean this, or did they mean that? Do they really feel that way about me? Is that their opinion about me, and you keep 
thinking about it and you keep marinating it and it just rolls over and before you know it that one little unkind word and statement now has grown into the fact that you think that the whole world is now against you. You ought to just quit worrying because you're never going to solve a problem and never going to solve an issue by the worry. You're only going to make the problem bigger and more expensive. The third reason that you ought to stop worrying, it's just a colossal waste of time. Uh, it, it's an energy robber. Uh, it will cause you to really have bigger problems than what you had. And, and, and Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he, he asks, uh, will worries add one single moment to your life? What a powerful question. C can I just say to you, Ladies and gentlemen, quit worrying. It's an amazing, colossal, amazing, I'll say it again, waste of time. Quit worrying. Now, let me just do something very practical. I don't usually do this when I'm speaking, but uh, today we're going to get real practical about a lot of things. I, I want you to take a minute right now, get your pen, I hope you already had your pen, and I want you to write down one thing that you are worried about. Just write it down on a piece of paper. You say, well, Pastor, I, I don't really know. Well, if you don't know what you're worried about, ask your spouse. I guarantee you they know. Ask your kids. They're going to know. Ask your mom and dad. They're going to know. Just ask somebody in the room with you right now. I don't know that I'm worried about anything, but if I am, would you please help me and tell me what it is? Because the fact of the matter is you can't let go of worry until you know what it is. You can't cast worry off until you understand it. You can't get rid of it until you identify what it really is. You say, well, Pastor, I'm worried, but I just can't put my finger on what the cause of my worry is. I, I, I just can't identify it. Well, I'll be very blunt with you. Um, if you could be specific about what you're worried about, it's a whole lot easier to deal with than if it's just in a general term. Much easier to eradicate if you get specific. So just sit down with that piece of paper and give yourself a little bit of time, maybe after the message today, and just make a list of some things that you're concerned about. Make a, make a list of some things that you are worried about and then when you look at that list and when you identify what they are, check it off and just simply say, you know what? In the name of Jesus, I, I'm, I'm not going to worry about this anymore. I can't handle it. Uh, I can't control it. Uh, there's no need for me to worry because it's robbing me of my energy. I can't fix it to start with and it's growing bigger when I think about it. So today I'm making a volitional choice by the grace of God, I'm not going to worry about that anymore. And then go down to the next one and check it off and do the very same thing. Now, the problem is a bunch of you brought into the relationship that you're in right now uh, like a garbage bag over your shoulder. You, you, you brought a bunch of junk with you into the relationship that you have really never dealt with. And it's caused a lot of anxiousness and it's caused a, a lot of worry in your life and in the relationship that you are in, even in your marriage. Can I just say to you, you need to let go of that stuff. You need to get rid of it. It may be grudges. Uh, maybe you're harboring some resentment uh, towards somebody else that you've never dealt with. Uh, maybe you've got some unforgiveness and some hurts maybe even some disappointments along the way, or maybe you're just carrying around a lot of remorse about something that you did or that you did not do, and, and you've just heaped all of that stuff up, and, and you're just a bundle of nerves. Um, by the way, I, I found this out uh, in, in my life because I, I, don't, uh, I really don't worry. Kathy will tell you... Um, I just, I'm like an old duck. It just rolls right off my back and I don't think about those things. But I found this out. From time to time, I need somebody to point out something in my life that they see that I'm overly concerned about or that I'm worried about or it's a garbage in my life. And I really need somebody to say, hey, Mike, uh, you know, I hate to tell you this, but do you know that you're a little bit obsessive about something here? That I, I just want to bring this 
uh, to your attention. That, that's, well, that's one of the things that I miss about church. That's one of the things that uh, I, I'm really struggling with right now because we need community. Uh, we, and, and that's why for all of these 37 years, I've pushed small groups. Well, we need that friend. We need that person in our life that is able to see those things in our life and to point them out and just come get nose to nose with us and say, let it go. Psalm 55, David said, give your worries to the Lord and he will take care of you. The Lord Jesus says, give me all of that stuff. Let me have it. Let me deal with it. You say, Mike, how in the world can I do that? Now, now listen to me. Get, get, get glued in. Get, get up on the edge of your seat for just a minute. Because there's only one way that you can ever manage that. And it's not going to another seminar. It's not going to another conference. It's not buying another book. There is only one way to deal with that, and that is through prayer. The only way that you can deal with worry in your life is to seek God on it. Somebody said this, and I believe it to be true. The more you pray, the less you worry. The more you worry, the less you pray. Prayer is the only way that any of us can deal with the worries in our life. Here's what Paul said in Philippians 4. He says, don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Pastor Jeff Smith, I, I've asked him to come. And uh, I, I'm, I've asked him, I, God laid him on my heart just for this uh, very reason. C come on up, Jeff. And, and I want Jeff to spend just a moment and I want him to briefly lead us in a time of prayer that we let go of the worries of our life, that we let go of the anxiousness of our life, that we bring in prayer to God and God says, you give me your worries and I'll replace it with my peace. Dear me, Father, we come very humbly before you, Lord. Coming in a spirit of surrender, Lord. Wanting to surrender our lives, our hearts, and our minds, and our worries to you right now. I think of those worries that have been written down. Those very things you're making specific in our hearts now, dear God. And we come with open hands, Lord, right now, bringing all the worries. And ask that you, dear God, reveal through others things that we are overly concerned about, dear God. Lord, and we're calling upon you as our Lord and our Master. Lord, we believe that you truly are supreme in authority. So, Lord, we want to get off the throne. And we want to accept that peace as we release these worries. Lord, we give them to you, Lord. And I pray that we'll continually, Lord, come before you that you'll remind us. And, Lord, we want to replace those worries with your word in our time in prayer with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Jeff, and I pray that already, right now, you've experienced a greater peace with God than you've had in a very long time. Now, there's a second uh, really hindrance uh, that God, I believe, is uh, saying to us that we need to let go of, and, and it's this. It's uh, quit opening up old wounds. Quit opening up old wounds. Psalm 109 says, David said this, he said, my heart is wounded. Now, he's not talking about external wounds. He's talking about internal wounds. And, and the fact of the matter is, external wounds heal pretty quickly. But those internal wounds take a lot more time to heal up than do the external wounds uh, in each of us. And, and it's those internal wounds that I want to talk about. When I was a kid... Uh, I really suffered a lot of external wounds, uh, but I don't remember them. Uh, I, I couldn't recall them very much, but I can tell you what, I still remember the internal wounds that I suffered of betrayal and loneliness 
and despair and harshness and neglect. I, I remember all of those internal wounds of rejection and fear and disappointment that came in my life. Many, 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 many people in this life, if they're not careful, will allow those internal wounds to mount up and they'll put them in a garbage bag and they'll drag them along with them as they try to run this race of life that God has set us in. You know what you need to do with those old wounds that you still got carrying around? Here's what we wind up doing. Listen very carefully. We replay those wounds over and over we rehearse them over and over. Uh, we relive them in our minds over and over again. And when we do that, what happens is, is that we open up those wounds and they become almost as fresh today as they were years and years ago. You understand that each time that you do that, it just reopens. That's the dumbest thing that I think that we as God's people ever do is just rehearse that stuff. It, it, it's really silly. It's really dumb. Your past is your past and you ought not to let the past control your present. Why? Because your past can't hurt you anymore. Only by your own choice when you allow it to become fresh and you rehearse it, then it opens up those wounds and brings more pain to you. I, I, I was talking to a couple of guys uh, in the last couple of days. And uh, I, I've really taught them and I've, I've taught many uh, this principle that, uh, that I use in my own life. And, and fact of the matter is there's hardly a day goes by that I don't have to use this formula. I've, I've told you this a little bit before, but let me remind you. I practice what's called the three R's. When, when I find, no matter what it is, if, if it's ungodly, if it's unhealthy, if it's something uh, that I have already asked forgiveness for, if it is something uh, that is uh, under the blood of Jesus, if it is something that I've already forgiven, and yet it'll come back up, here's the first thing. I recognize that that is a thought that I ought not to be entertaining. The, the second thing is I, I do this. I reject that thought in the name of Jesus. Now, you can recognize that this is a thought that you ought not to be entertaining. And you can even reject it and plead the blood of Jesus over that thought. But if you don't replace it, it's just going to lie there and continue to eat at you. And so you have to replace it. And, and what I do is I'll sing a gospel song. I'll quote a passage of scripture. I will purposefully take my mind onto something that I know that is pleasing to God. And eventually, I'm going to get victory over that. And Satan's going to have to come or my flesh is going to have to come at me in a different way because I've gotten the victory over that. But I practice those three R's all of the time specifically when it comes to the hurt and the disappointment and the pain of my past. I'm not going to let it reopen the wounds and rob me of the joy of the Lord that is now in my present. And so I'm just going to call on you right now. Decide today that you're not going to let your past rob you of the joy of Jesus for today. All right. Psalm 37, 8 says, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. That's an incredible word. It leads only to evil. Now that word fret means to get preoccupied. And, and what we wind up doing is we get preoccupied with resentment. We get preoccupied with bitterness. And we hold on to those hurts that we should have given to Jesus a long time ago. And it reopens the wound afresh and anew. You say, why is it so important that I do that? Well, here's the fact. You will never be able to get ready for the future that God has in store for you if you are still continually being controlled by the past. God has a great future for you. But if you're living in the hurts of yesterday, you will never know the joys for today. Uh, 
what, what, what hurts? Let me just get real practical with you one more time. And you may want to write them down. What hurts do you need to quit opening up today? Let me ask you a question. Don't you think you've hurt long enough? Don't you think you've endured the pain long enough? Don't you think that you have been controlled by what somebody else has done to you in the past long enough? Let it go. Now, if worrying is overcome by prayer, then bitterness and forgiveness and wounds are overcome through forgiveness. Now, I've said this in, in numerous messages throughout my ministry. There are two reasons why that you ought to forgive. You ready? Nothing profound here. Pretty simple. This is Christianity 101. First of all, because God says to. And second, because God has forgiven you. Let it go. Ephesians 4 says, and, and, and it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So here's the practicality. Who do you need to forgive today? What person do you need to forgive? What wound do you need to allow to heal? What bitterness are you carrying around that you need to let go? May I say to you this morning or tonight, whenever you're watching, uh, <laughs> the only person that you're hurting by carrying that around is you. Psalm 147 in verse 3, the Bible says, He heals the brokenhearted, and binds up their wounds. Only God can heal that wound for you. Only God can bind up that hurt. Let it go and let God do it. And the way that you do it is forgiveness. Let, let me help you with one more thing. And then Rick Brown is going to come. I, I, I thought about Rick and, and purposely ask him to pray over this because I know what he's been through. I know the hurts and the pains, and I know all of, 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 of what God has allowed him to go through in his past. And I can tell you, Rick Brown walks in the peace of God today because he's learned how to forgive. Uh, one thing that, that I would say to you, there are some times in your life that you'll be able to just get honest with God and say, you know what, God, I can't forgive that person, but I am here right now, and, and I want you to forgive them through me. Rick, come and lead us now as we pray together. Let's pray. Father, we come in this moment and I lift up the people who are hearing this sermon today. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, the mighty and holy name of Jesus, that you would help all of us to learn how to forgive. And Lord, that begins with understanding that we, we can't deny that our hurt is there. Somebody's hurt us and, and we won't forgive them and that denial drives us away from you. Lord, sometimes there's points where we have hurt somebody and we need to understand your word says if, two are, if someone has done something to you, you need to go to them and make amends. Lord, you are a good God and you have forgiven us and you ask us to do the same. You command us to do the same. Lord, your word says in Psalm 107 that you have cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. And Lord, it is possible for us to take those who have hurt us and those that we've hurt and to separate ourselves from them, to forgive them uh, and, and cast it as far as Jesus has cast our sins. Lord, it isn't really about that person. It really is for us. It's, it's for us to become more like you, Lord, to forgive. I pray for every person hearing this prayer that they would understand the importance of forgiving. God, you did it for us and you ask us to, you tell us to do it to others who have hurt us. We all have a hurt or a habit or a hang up from someone in the past and I pray Jesus that you would help us to deal with, uh, with those pains and hurts that amen. have come to us. In the name amen. of Jesus I ask, amen. 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 Alright, so we've, we've looked at if you're going to run this race without being encumbered, you've you got to stop worrying and, and you've got to let go of the hurts 
and quit reopening the wounds. And then third, you know, if you're ever going to be who God wants you to be, you've got to quit carrying around guilt. I've seen this so often in so many people's lives. They just can't deal with the guilt. Guilt of their past sins, guilt of their mistakes and their failures, uh, things that they wish that they had not done, but they did them anyway. Why, why pastor, um, should I be free from guilt? Well, listen to God's word from Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. He says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. I want you to see what, what, what the word is teaching us here about unconfessed sin, about guilt of our past. The first thing that he says is that it separates us from God. What a powerful word. Have you ever felt that God is so distant? Have you ever just gone to God in prayer and you felt like that your prayers weren't getting above the ceiling? Have you ever felt alienated from God and that God didn't seem to be within a million miles from where you are? Hey, guess what? God didn't move. You did. You did. Last thing that I do normally when I'm getting ready to leave the house for a day or two is that we're going to take out the garbage. How often do you take out the garbage uh, in your house? Uh, would you agree with me that if you only took the garbage out of your house uh, about once a year, don't, don't you think your house would get to stinking just a little bit? The, the fact of the matter is, you know, we, we're going to take out our garbage uh, pretty much daily uh, out of our life. But why is it spiritually that we allow garbage to mount up and to pile up so high that the Word of God says, that you can't even see God, that God can't hear you because we've allowed so much to be undealt with, uh, sins that have never been confessed. God says, get rid of that guilt, get rid of that sin, and it has to be done on a daily basis. So here's the practicality. I want you to sit down and I want you to just to write down in a list some things that you know that's in your life that you've never confessed and dealt with before God. And just do it. You say, well, you know, matter of fact, I was talking to a guy today and uh, we were talking about this very subject. And uh, he, he says, you know, I, I just don't know of anything. I, I said, well, just get before God with a piece of paper and a pencil and guess at it. And, and, and I promise you, you're going to hit it more often than not. And here's what normally happens. Once you begin that process and you get to that point, well, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal to you another one. And then there's another one. And, then, and before long, you could write a book in and, and, and the sins that we have accumulated uh, in our life. And, and you get that list and you say, Lord Jesus, I agree with you about this. And you confess it before God and you forsake it and you go in a different direction than you were going in that had to do with that sin. It separates you from God. Second, it depresses you. Guilt will depress you. Psalm chapter 32 verse 3, the Bible says, When I refused to confess my sin... My body wasted away and I groaned all the day long. I can promise you this. Unconfessed sin will have a physical response uh, in you. And absolutely nothing will make you more miserable in this life than to carry around a bunch of guilt of unconfessed sin. Here's a statement that I want you to remember. You ready for this one? You cannot be happy and guilty at the same time. If you're guilty, 
you're never going to be happy. And if you're happy, it's because you don't have any guilt. Uh, you can't have both of them at the same time. The, the third thing is that it dominates your mind. In Psalm 51, verse 3, the Bible says, I know about my wrongs and I can't forget my sins. Listen, as a child of God, you, you know that you can push it down. You can hide those sins and, and you can shove them down but ultimately, they're going to pop up somewhere. It's like getting a dozen ping pong balls out in the middle of a swimming pool. And you try to keep them under the water. Eventually, they're going to pop up somewhere. And that's the same thing that's going to happen to your sin when you allow it to go unconfessed. You say, how in the world, Pastor, do I quit carrying around guilt? If prayer is the only way to stop worrying, if forgiveness is the only way for my wounds to heal, then confession is the only way that you will ever deal with your guilt. So you come to the place that you agree with God about what God says about your sin. Here's my encouragement to you. Quit trying to justify your sin. Quit trying to rationalize it. Quit trying to explain it away. Just come to the place that you see it as God sees it and you agree with him about it and confess it and just simply say, you know what, God, you're exactly right. What I did was wrong. God, what I did was sin. God, I blew it. I don't know about you, but I am grateful to God for 1 John 1 and 9. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I'm grateful for that. As a matter of fact, that's probably the most used verse that I have in my life. And I claim it in the name of Jesus on a daily basis as I go before God and I just say, you know what, God, I've blown it again today. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I thought about Nate Lynch. Nate, I want you to come and I want you to lead us in prayer because I've seen what God has done in your heart and in your life. And I know one of the great things that God has done in Nate's life is that he has wiped his past clean and given him a brand new start. And, 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 and the blood of Jesus has washed him of all of his sin. And, and Nate, I want you to come and I want you to lead us in this season of prayer and just let God speak to you and through you to our people. Let's pray. Father, we know that there's nothing that you can't do, God. Father, we know that your word says that you can put flesh on dry bones, that you can turn the heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Father, that you can raise the dead. And Father, we know because of what your word says that you can take a story of guilt and shame and turn it into a beautiful picture of grace. Father, that happens when we confess our sin unto you. Father, as preacher said, what 1 John says, if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, Father. Father, it says that you are both faithful and just. Father, it's not just something that you do once, but you faithfully do in it time and time and time again in our life, Father. And you have the right to do that for you are just. You have the right to do it because of what your son did for us on the cross. Father, you are the one that makes the dead come back to life. You are the one that splits the Red Sea. You are the one that moves mountains. And so, Father, if you can do all these great things, then you can come into our lives and free us from our guilt and shame. And so I declare over that man, that woman's life right now, who is struggling with guilt, that is struggling with the shame of the past, that, Father, that you would come in and that you would rewrite the past and their story and change it from that guilt into grace. 
God, I know that you are able to do it. And so we pray that you would do it in households, in cars, in families today. That you would rewrite that past. And Father, that that guilt would turn into grace and we would experience and taste your goodness once again. Oh God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for that marvelous grace that washed away our sins. And for those who have not experienced that grace, may they come today and experience it. In your holy name, amen. Thank you, Nate. Here's, here's the message. Lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset you, that keeps you from being who God wants you to be, that slows you down in this race of life. And if you're a worrier, go to God in prayer. And the more you pray, the less you'll worry. If you have major wounds of the past that you keep reopening, the only way to deal with that is through forgiveness. And you just need to yield to the power of the Holy Spirit in your heart and your life and let him forgive through you. And maybe you're one of those people that you messed up somewhere along the way and, and you just haven't been able to forgive yourself. You understand that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you of all sin. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, right now, why don't you just bow your head, close your eyes, admit that you're a sinner. Just say that. Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that my sin has separated me from you. Just agree with God about it right now. And just simply go to God and say, you know what, God? I want you to come into my heart and I want you to save my soul. And God, with your help, I'm going to live for you the rest of my life. Would you commit your life to Jesus right now? Admit that you're a sinner. Invite him into your heart and your life. Ask him to forgive you. And determine that with God's help, you're going to live for him the rest of your life. If you prayed something like that with me, I really want to know about it. I want to hear from you. Take a few minutes and go to our website and fill out that little form that says, I asked Jesus to come into my heart today and just let me know who you were. Let me know that you did that. It encouraged all of us, me, the staff, and our whole body that's here to know that God is using this season in our life and this media that we are presenting the gospel and making a difference in somebody. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.